Good evening, everybody. Welcome to NYU Stern. Um, the In Conversation with Lord Mervyn King series has become one of NYU's most anticipated events uh, of the year. And we have another blockbuster evening today with a very special guest. So just wanted to welcome you all. Just two house rules I wanted to remind you of. One, please no photographs from the aisles, but you're welcome to take photographs or, uh, or, or uh, from, from your seats. Also, we will have a question and answer session with Ms. Nui at the, so Dr. Uh, Lord King and Ms. Nui will have a conversation for about 45 minutes and then they will open it up to the audience. So if you have any questions, there will be mics placed in the aisles and you can step up and ask your questions then. Thank you all. And for those of you who are able to stay after seven o'clock, there will be a reception following this event. You're welcome to join us. Thank you, Raghu. Hello, everyone. Good evening, and welcome to another In Conversation with Event. My guest this evening is Indra Nui. She was Chief Executive, CEO of PepsiCo for 12 years, from 2006 through 2018. Consistently ranked as one of the most powerful people in business across the world. She was born in Madras, educated in India, and now has made her home in the United States. A few weeks ago, the Financial Times said that if there were a Nobel Prize for management, Indra Nui would be their nominee. She has powerful and strong views about how companies should work. So please give a very warm, stern welcome to Indra Nui. I missed that article. <laughs> we'll get it for you. Oh. Well, Indra, thank you for coming to Stern. Pleasure. Uh, we'll talk, and then many of the people here, I hope students will ask questions later mm. on. And happy birthday for yesterday, I think. Thank you. <laughs> There's a lot of discussion today about the role of a corporation or company in the world what it should do, should it maximize shareholder value, should it have wider purposes. When you're at PepsiCo, you introduced the idea of performance with purpose. Can you tell us something about what that meant and, and why you did it? Hmm. Let me, um, first of all, thank you for having me here, Mervyn. I've seen the YouTube videos of the In Conversation with Lord Mervyn King, and um, I always looked at this as a very, um, prestigious opportunity, so thank you for having me. It's our pleasure. Um, and I'm, there's a great birthday present for me too, so thank you. Um, let me talk a little bit about PepsiCo and performance with purpose. Um, when we did performance with purpose, it felt like the only thing we should be doing to run a responsible company. In retrospect, everybody talks about it as if it was something frame-breaking. So uh -huh. I think I should plot some of the arc of progress for you. Um, PepsiCo has always been a high-performing company. The financial performance was always very strong. We made the changes to our business when we needed to make it. And it's always been a well-managed company. Um, and the way I'd put it is, we were a responsible company. Uh, we invested for the long term. We delivered results in the short term. We had an excellent board. We had excellent corporate governance. We treated our customers, our suppliers, our employees in a wonderful way. So we ran a responsible company. When I became CEO, one thing became very apparent, that the world around us was changing in profound ways. And even though we weren't seeing the, the impact of all of that immediately, we were going to begin to see them in the next few years. And how did, we, how did I realize the changes were coming? Let me give you a couple of examples. One, um, in PepsiCo, in all our meetings, we have a, a, a big uh, table on the side of every conference room. In the late 1990s, the products used to be regular Pepsi or full sugar Pepsi, full sugar Mountain Dew, a little bit of diet Pepsi or diet Dew. By the early 2000s, you know, between 2000 and 2006, it shifted to a um, little bit more diet Pepsi and diet Dew. And by 2006, seven, there's a lot more Aquafina water showing up. Uh -huh. And then it's not just the products that were on the credenza, it's the depletion rate the water and the diet products had to be replaced two or three times during the meeting 
and the regular sugar products would stay around with very low depletion. Now, to me, that's very telling, because that basically says, even among the PepsiCo employees, we're all consumers, uh, their behaviors and their habits were changing. Um, and then as you talk to them and really understand what was going on, they would tell you that their families were also changing the way they consume products, what they fed their kids. That was, to me, a profound trigger to say that the whole health and wellness trend was not a fad or something people were just talking about on the edges. It's really changing the core of consumer behavior. Um, the other thing one noticed was that in many cities around the world, we were being denied a license to expand our plants because we used a lot of water. Uh -huh. We used three liters of water to make a liter of Pepsi. I grew up in Madras in India where there was no water for living. Uh -huh. And it seemed unconscionable that we could have a Pepsi plant in the outskirts of Madras using three liters of water to make a liter of Pepsi when the people in the city of Madras didn't have water to drink or bathe or carry out their day-to-day -day responsibilities. Similarly on plastics, landfills were becoming full Landfill, landfills were being shut down, and there was no place to store all the plastic. So as you put all of these things together, these trends, we realized that as a company, we had to change in profound ways. But the CEO deciding you have to change in profound ways doesn't help. You've got to build the case uh -huh. to make the change. Um, so we started a piece of work where we identified the mega trends that were going to impact the company over the next decade or so. Health and wellness, uh, aging population, the environmental focus, uh, cybersecurity. There were about 10 mega trends we identified. And then we said, what are we going to do to fundamentally change our company in response to these mega trends? So if we didn't have those mega trends and I came forward and said, we're going to make a shift to health and wellness, people would say, forget it. You know, we are a company that makes treat-like products. We're going to yep. keep making them. And there'd be a lot of resistance. But once we showed them these mega trends, and allowed people to debate and discuss the megatrends. And once they bought into the megatrends, making the change was pretty easy. But the key thing is we had to do the megatrends outside in, not inside out. Had we done it inside out, it would have been incremental. We had to do it outside in, so it would really frame the world. The second thing we had to do is find the right language to talk about these megatrends. And that's how the words purpose Ah. were born. Today, people talk about purpose as if it's a new way of running the company. It's not a new way of running the company. It's throwing heart into the company to say, ah. there's a reason we exist. You know, a tobacco company never says the reason we exist is to create lung cancer. They don't say that. Um, PepsiCo never said the reason we exist is to make people obese. That's not the reason we exist. We existed to provide convenient foods and beverages. Society changed, so we have to change. Because that is the responsibility of a corporation to change when societies have to change. So performance with purpose was about delivering performance. But the purpose element was threefold. Change the product portfolio to make it healthier and dial up the really positively healthy products, reduce our environmental footprint, and make the company a more inclusive company so everybody could bring their whole self to work. And the wonderful thing about performance with purpose was if we didn't work on purpose, we couldn't deliver performance. If we didn't deliver performance, we couldn't fund purpose. Uh -huh. So we changed the way we made money. We didn't give away money we made. And then we went on this campaign to sell it across the company and kept hammering the same message for 12 years, put the investments behind it, and we delivered results. T tell us a bit more about how you actually in practice persuaded the employees to uh -huh. buy into this message? Because that was, I can see the leadership coming from you, but how did you get the very large number of employees to buy in? It was interesting. The rank and file got it right away. The young people got it. Um, the real problem was what I call the frozen top. Usually the top <laughs> two layers of the company take the longest time to buy into any change. Mm -hmm. And you can't blame them. You know, they're often referred to as a frozen top because they're stuck in their ways. The reason they're hard to convince is because the minute they hear about a change program, the first thing that goes through their head is, oh my god, how am I going to deliver my targets? How am I going to deliver on the quarterly numbers? Will they give me enough investment? So they're very pragmatic. So what you've got to do with these people is to say, look, we are going to give you the investments. We are going to modify your targets. We do expect a behavior change from you. 
And incidentally, if you don't sign up to the behavior change program in six months or two years, you're going to have to get off this uh, engine because we never told people we're going to fire them. We told them we're going to retire them. And so we had a lot of retirement parties for people who didn't stay with the program. That's one. The second thing we did is, uh, the first thing I did is I went to Frito-Lay North America. Anybody know Frito-Lay? Makes Doritos, Tostitos, Fritos, anything with toes. They're based in Texas, OK? Right. TOS, not to here. They're based in Texas. And they believed any message that came from New York was overheads. So they were the biggest skeptics, and they rejected us. So the first day that I crafted Performance of Purpose, I went down to Texas, and I spent a day with them and said, this is what I'm thinking of doing in PepsiCo. I had laid out the whole rationale. Uh, and I said, what do you think about this? They said, we'll think about it and come back to you. And lo and behold, they flew up to New York, which is highly unusual for my Frito-Lay chaps. They flew up to New York, and they said, we love it. <clears throat> this is the only way to run the company. And we have signed up now to reduce the fat and salt in all our core salty snack products. So the Lay's potato chips you eat today has about 20 to 25% less salt than it did a decade ago. It's fried and heart healthy mm -hmm. oil. It's got a simple label, just three ingredients. If you look at the back of a Lay's yellow bag, a plain salted, you'll see three ingredients, potatoes, oil, and salt. And, um, it's a great chip to have. So if you're going to eat a potato chip, eat the Lay's. Because I will. It's the, it's the, it's the healthiest of the potato chips. That's, so, you know, that's what we were aiming to do. Tomorrow morning, I will. I'll try it, I promise. It goes well with dinner. Split. <laughs> <laughs> now, you left PepsiCo last year, mm -hmm. and you're now a non-executive director of Amazon, one of these big tech giants that we're all <laughs> loving to hate. What, what are the challenges of being a non-executive director of one of these big tech companies? How many of you are Amazon customers? Show of hands. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, I tell you something. I consider being on the board of Amazon sort of a privilege. And um, you get a front row seat to, the, uh, to how life is going to change with the application of technology for the better. And as a person who practiced performance with purpose for a decade, a lot of people ask me about, you know, if you're so purpose-driven, why would you get on the Amazon board? Of course, it's getting rid of retail and all that good stuff. Uh, I thought long and hard about joining the Amazon board because I had the pick of so many companies that I could have joined the board of. I joined Amazon with great joy because I thought Amazon actually was a company with the deepest sense of purpose. And I'll tell you what I mean by that. Amazon gives you something that you don't get, which is the gift of time. With a swipe, you can convert all home administrative tasks and get rid of it. You can reduce the time on everything that's home administration. Um, and um, when you can do that, and you can get that time back, you can now use that time for nurturing activities, which is what you took the time from to do home administration. I don't know about you guys. when. I had my children. I'd pick them up, put them in the car seat, drive to the grocery store, take them out of the car seat, put them in the grocery cart, screaming kids going through the store. Hey, now you want to do anything at home? Do it. Just swipe, swipe, and the mm -hmm. products appear at home. So to me, Amazon is an amazing example of purpose. They give you the gift of time. Which other company can say that? So I look at it as an extension of the performance of purpose that I was practicing to be part of a purpose-driven company. And so I actually consider it an incredible privilege to be part of this company. So you talked about it being a privilege, but it's also a challenge because you have a responsibility as a non-executive director. Has it been easy to take on the role of non-executive, having been a chief executive for so long? <laughs> and what are you, is, is there something particularly challenging about being a non-executive of a company like that? You know, a newly retired CEO always struggles with being a non-executive director because you're dying to interfere in the company's day-to-day -day operations because that's what you did for all your life, yeah, right? Absolutely. So you always think you can do better than the company. Um, the good news is that in the case of Amazon, there's no way I can do better than the company <laughs> because they're so damn smart. But I, I'm also learning how to be a good non-exec director mm -hmm. by... Uh, providing the right governance input, but not overstepping the bounds. 
But you know, where a non-exec director flourishes is when you have good management and a good CEO. Mm -hmm. And that's what we have in Amazon. I mean, I'm not a commercial for Amazon, but for those of you who know Jeff Bezos, one of the most brilliant people I've met. And the big difference is that as a founder, he acts like a public company CEO, not as a founder CEO. Uh -huh. So he comes to every board meeting, listens to the board, sits through every second of the board meeting, listens to us, and the board is a very vocal board. And so um, you know, it's easy to be a non-executive director of a successful company, changing the world with a sense of purpose, where the founder CEO is acting like a public company CEO who doesn't have you know, preferred class of stock. So it's the ideal world for a non-exec board member. So if you look at the range of very big high-tech companies in the US, several of them, probably not Apple, but most of the others are still run directly or indirectly by the founders and mm -hmm. the people who started them. Do you think that all of them will face a serious challenge when those individuals retire, disappear, go? I don't know. I think technology is changing so rapidly that these companies have to keep reinventing yes. themselves. Many young founder CEOs I know to stay on because they believe that if you moved out of them into a professional CEO, they'll start to focus too much on quarterly earnings as opposed to reinvesting constantly mm. into the future in an industry that has got a voracious appetite for capital. Uh, and so these uh, young founders have never run these huge companies stick around. The better young uh, founders surround themselves with great managers so that mm -hmm. you know, the company is not so dependent on one person, but they build the shoulders so the company can continue on if anything were to happen to them or if they choose to just step out and right. go their merry ways. And one of your roles presumably is to Succession planning and, and is a big advise yeah. on that, play a role in it. That's a big, uh, important yeah. part of a non-executive chair. Now, you've regularly been ranked as one of the world's most powerful business leaders. Um, what, what is power in that sense? And, and do you enjoy being powerful? <laughs> you know, uh, I think that that most powerful women list, uh, which was really where you know, people like me started to show up, was because there weren't enough of us. And they wanted to shine a light on us to say, hey, these women have arrived at last. Yeah. And so I don't think it, uh, the focus was on powerful as opposed to um, there are women. <laughs> There's just recognition right. that we've reached the CEO suite. Um, it's unfortunate that we need that list of most powerful mm -hmm. women as opposed to women showing up in the most powerful business people. Mm -hmm or whatever, the most prominent business people. Yeah. You can put whatever name you right. want, uh, you know, uh, definition you want. But I still think that with less than 6% of uh, Fortune 500 companies being run by women, it's going to be a long haul before uh, we get a critical mass of women so we don't have to worry about these lists. Why do you think it's so low? I mean, that in almost all other professions, there's been an enormous change as the cohorts of younger women come through. But as you say, as chief executives, it still remains remarkably low in comparison with you know, politics or many other professions now. The problem with uh, CEOs is we're not born CEOs, we have to develop CEOs. Mm -hmm. And you get a lot of women into the entry level. By the time you reach the third level, the number of women in the uh, jobs have or even yeah. go down by 60 or 70 percent because it's very hard for women in particular to balance you know, having a family and work mm. because we don't have the care ecosystem no. in the country to support them. We don't have flexible work hours. We don't have good maternity, paternity mm -hmm. care. So it's very hard for them to stay in the workforce if they choose to get married and have kids. Um, some women just say, look, I can't stand the bias that I face in the workforce. So I want to up and leave. Uh, other women leave because uh, they have incredible responsibilities at home to care for aging parents. Mm -hmm. So I think that, um, I mean, I heard a statistic which blew me away. It said 70% of high school valedictorians are women. 53% of the top grades and college graduates are obtained by women. Yes. Even MIT graduates, 53% of the engineering class is women. 
where have all the women gone? Uh -huh. Okay. If we now say that the valedictorians, the top grades, the top grade obtainers, are not the people we're going to pick from to be CEOs, what we're saying is, from the other 47%, which is not that great, we'll pick CEOs. That's really what we're saying. Okay. And I think we have to figure out how to grease the skids so we can allow women to ascend. We have to do a lot of stuff. We have to address the care ecosystem. We have to address this bias issue, which is still incredibly uh, prevalent in um, business today, not just corporate America, but business as a whole. Um, and we do have to figure out um, how we can redo communities, families, societies, so we allow young people, not just women, young people, to integrate work and family. That's the next big challenge in front of us. So it's very interesting you mention it. My wife is from Finland. Uh -huh. She ran her own company. Yeah. My two stepdaughters are high-flying executives. They've all benefited from extraordinary childcare provision in Scandinavia, which is provided collectively. Mm. So society provides right, exactly. the resources to finance childcare. Uh, and, and so it's just quite normal for women to, to combine, a, you don't have to take a big step out of a career, mm -hmm. and it's accepted that people go back and continue. And yet when I was at the Bank of England, what was very clear was that exactly as you said, over, just over 50% of our intake were women yeah. as economists. Mm. Um, and yet when it came to the higher levels, people had dropped out. Where had they gone? They'd taken a career break. It was impossible to for the bank to provide childcare because people live so far away, there was no other provision. And gradually people dropped out. And once they dropped out, it was hard to persuade them to come back. Because there is no return ramp for many of those yes. people who drop yeah. out. Because you're not with your cohort group, you don't have the right jobs for them. And technology has passed them by. So we have no program to retrain them to bring them back. So I think if we want to really improve the productivity of the country, we're going to have to find a way to bring many of those people who have dropped out of the workforce back into the workforce. We have a job to do. I did notice when I was at the bank that one of the big changes was that the younger generation of men took their own responsibilities for childcare mm -hmm. seriously. So when we introduced flexible working, yeah. we, it was for everyone. Mm. And men were taking advantage to spend one or two days a week at home to take their turn for childcare. Did you see that in, is this growing? I think maternity and paternity care are both growing. I think what we have to do is not to uh, shame men for taking their paternity mm -hmm. leave. Mm -hmm. We've got to make it more mainstream and normal so that, in fact, we have to force the men to take the paternity care. Not play golf taking the paternity <laughs> care, but actually <laughs> go home and help right. uh, with care. Right. But uh, if we can, <clears throat> Make that more a uh, normal thing as opposed to, I can't believe you're taking the paternity care, are you not interested in your job kind of thing. Yeah. I think uh, young people, look, we want young people in, in our country here to have 2.1 kids, which is a replacement rate. We are sitting at about 1.6 to 1.7. Mm. That is a dangerously low number. Mm. So we have work to do to get the birth rate up. Mm. So a lot of potential female executives here in the audience as students. What, what advice would you give them as to how to manage the career and deal with some of these challenges? I don't think they can do it just by themselves. I think very often we've just told the young women, it's your problem. You know, many books have been written about, make a checklist, okay? Uh, other people have said, uh, prioritize, brutally prioritize, say no to things. No. Why does it have to be just the woman carrying the burden? Yeah. Um, I think we have to change the dialogue from asking women to do it all to asking the question, what do governments, communities, societies, families, companies, what do we have to do collectively to enable the country to have productive young kids come into the whole population pool so we can have wonderful future citizens? So I'll tell you one thing. If we could solve one thing uh, across the country, we'd make a huge uh, contribution to young women staying in the workforce, that zero to five childcare. Outstanding childcare for children zero to five. 
with certified child care workers and great child care facilities, really well taken care of. It will contribute to wonderful children, productive families, and I think the economy will benefit. Now, you were born in Madras. Mm -hmm. You came to the United States. Why did you come here? You know, when I came here in 1978, uh, the U.S. was a beacon for everything, for hope, dreams, um, the greatest inventions in the world. Um, all my friends were here already, and uh, I applied uh, to Yale, to the business school, literally on a sort of uh, a lark to see what would happen. I never thought I'd get in. And when the letter arrived, which said, you've got so much scholarship and so much loans, the loans seemed like an astoundingly high number. But you know what? I got in. And um, I crossed the seas and came here and never regretted it. Gail was a great experience. Mm. So you had a lot of experience in US industry now at different mm. levels, now as a non-executive. Do you think that executive remuneration has reached levels which are simply too high in the US? Or how should we think about it? What is NYU's perspective on this? <laughs> <laughs> I think we look upwards you sit at, at the remuneration. You sit at, you sit at the uh, center of greed. <laughs> Tell me about it. <laughs> well, I think we can see that there are people in New York whose remuneration outside Stern is a lot higher than not only people in Stern, but the average person <laughs> living in New York. So the ratio of the uh, remuneration of chief executives of the top 500 companies mm. to the average incomes of their employees has risen very substantially over the last 20, 30, 40 years. Yeah. Do you think that's justified? And so what, one has to be very careful in looking at that particular metric because uh, let me take a Google which has engineers and designers and high uh, you know, income people, yep. uh, the, the employees, and the CEO ratio might look, at, look like 350 times the average or the median of the employees. You take a company like PepsiCo, where we have frontline salesmen, truck drivers, that's the large population pools, and they're truly global. I mean, they're right. in uh, emerging markets, developing markets, and if you took the median of that population pool, the CEO compensation might look like 600. But the CEO of PepsiCo gets paid a lot less than the CEO of a tech company. So, you know, you have to be very careful with ratios that are blunt instruments. Instead, let me talk a little bit about CEO compensation. There's no question that our CEOs get paid very well. But most of our compensation is in stock. 85% of my compensation was stock. The stock did well, I did well. The stock didn't do well, I didn't do well. In fact, uh, the cash compensation, the cash portion of the compensation was pretty low. Mm -hmm. Now. Where the problem comes about is going back all the way to the first question, Mervyn. A CEO can run the company for the duration of the CEO. You can say, I want to be CEO for six years, which is the average tenure. I'm going to cut all investments. I'm going to run the company to maximize EPS. The stock will go up. I'll be rich. I'll retire. The new CEO will come in and say, everything that the old CEO did was wrong. I'm going to take a huge reset, which is what most new CEOs do. And then they ride the alpha, as they call it. Whoever came up with that name, I don't know. They ride the alpha. And the next CEO comes in after five or six years and does the same thing. That is a terrible way to run the company. I always think CEOs should run the company for the duration of the company, not the duration of the CEO. And so, you know, the old poem by Lord Tennyson, The Brook, which says, yeah. men may come and men may go, yeah. but I go on, on forever. forever. That's what corporations should be doing. Mm. Men may come and men may go, but corporations go on forever. So I think that if we approach running a company with that mindset and invested judiciously to balance level and duration of returns, people focus too much on level of returns. But if you balance level and duration of returns, I think what you'll end up with is a reasonable increase in stock price. Um, and don't start off by saying, I'm going to beat every index. It makes no sense. Run a responsible company which balances level and duration, and if that results in a good increase in stock price, you deserve to get paid. So when I was at the Bank of England and, and visited lots of companies, mm. I was always struck that the companies that were successful were run by people who didn't wake up in the morning and say, gosh, how can I make money today? 
They were run by people who were passionate about what the company was doing, mm. believed in the product, and they wanted to be judged in a way by the success of the product. Making money is a bit of a side effect of that. If you run a really good company, it will happen to make money. But if you sit up every morning and say, I want to make money, then as you say, you just cut costs mm -hmm. and you drive the company into the ground. Mm -hmm. So it's a question of choosing the right people to, to run these companies. It's that and also what we teach students in business schools. Mm -hmm. I would strongly urge our dean here. Um, I think that um, we have forgotten to teach students responsible management of enterprises. We quickly go to corporate social responsibility and talk about doing social programs. That's not what we're talking mm -hmm. about. How do you run a responsible company so you make money the right way? And yeah. let me give you a simple example. If you're in a marketplace that's growing at 3% and your company is growing revenues at 4%, by definition, you're gaining share, okay? If you now grow profits 7 or 8%, boy, you've got a great spread between revenue and profits. If you now grow profits 10, 12, 13% every quarter, it means you're cutting some investment means you're cutting some investment, unless you've got extraordinary returns from your innovation. So there are some very simple ways you, you can look at a company's P&L, look at the leverage from market growth to revenue growth to uh, bottom line growth to EPS growth and say, where is the company getting the leverage? And any investor who looks at the company should say, if you have extraordinary profit growth, which is not commensurate with your top line growth for a long time, what are you cutting? Show me your innovation pipeline. Where is the price premium? And if you can't ask those basic questions, then don't complain that the company is doing badly after the CEO left. To me, this is where you've got people who are so happy with short-term returns <coughs> that they criticize everybody who is generating good returns but not extraordinary returns in the short term. And that's where your mismatch comes between investor behavior and corporate behavior. Is being a CEO a lonely job? Um, it is a difficult job. Yeah, it is lonely because you can't really talk about it, talk about issues with your colleagues at work mm -hmm. because you're the CEO. Um, you can't talk about it with third parties because everything is subject to confidentiality. Uh, I could talk about 10% of the issues with my husband, not all of them, because if I said to him, you know, so-and-so didn't really listen to me and was rude to me, the next time my husband sees them at a party, he won't talk to them. <laughs> so I decided I am not discussing anything to do with the PepsiCo and people right. with him. So you right. sort of bottle it all up inside you. Um, what we had was a little kitchen cabinet. There were five of us uh -huh. CEOs, J&J, &J, GE, IBM, American Express, myself, and mm -hmm. we would meet once a quarter, and um, right. we could sort of discuss mm -hmm. issues, not provide too much detail, but we could get advice from each other. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that helped some, uh, but it is a lonely job, and unless you have the uh, backbone, the desire, the mental makeup mm -hmm. to do that, don't take it on. Now, you've held very important jobs, now involved with Amazon, this is, this is big stuff, but one of your positions is far more important than any of those, yeah. which is that you're on the board of the International Cricket Council. Mm. Now this is, <laughs> this is undoubtedly the most important organization in the world. Um, cricket seems to me to be a sport that tells us a lot about life. It's at any mm. moment, two individuals are battling each other, but it, you only win or lose within a team. Why did you take this on, and what do you think are the lessons from cricket which many of our audience need to understand if they're <laughs> going to be successful in life? Why did I take it on? You know, um, when I was growing up, cricket was religion in India. Yeah. It still is, yeah. as you know. And um, cricket those days was just beautiful, this game. Everybody was in whites, not these multiple yes, rainbow colors. Absolutely. There wasn't as much protective gear that people mm. wore, so it was... Really a fun game to watch. Not that I like people getting hit by bouncers, but <laughs> you know, it was a fun game. Yeah. Um, and when I went to college, uh, there was no women's cricket at that time. This was 1970, 71. Mm -hmm. There was no women's cricket at all. And we started the first college cricket team mm -hmm. and, uh, for women. 
And then the other colleges in Madras started women's cricket teams. And we played cricket and loved it, loved the game, loved getting involved in the game of cricket. Um, and I'll tell you an interesting story, uh, a humorous story. The first match we played against another women's cricket team, the men were the umps. And so, like, I was bowling. How many of you know cricket here? Show of hands. OK, quite a few. So I was bowling. First ball, the person's LBW. Okay, and I asked for a call and say, LBW out, and the ump doesn't give me the call. Mad like hell. But the third over, clean bowled, it's over. <laughs> so I look at the ump and say, what happened in the first over? Why didn't you give her out? He says to me, she was a good looking gal, I wanted to see her for two more overs. <laughs> you see, this, this is what we faced it. in cricket. Indeed. In cricket, okay? So it's, cha <laughs> it's changed since, but that's yeah. where women's cricket came from. Today, we are gearing up for women's cricket on a large scale yeah. basis. And I got involved with ICC because, um, you know, here is a chance to see cricket at the highest levels, the governing body of cricket, um, which needs changes in governance, to be honest. Uh, it's still a country led organization. I'm, I'm the only independent board member, so I watch all the bickering yeah. and I have to figure out <laughs> how to help the warring parties come together and resolve stuff. I'm not always successful, but I'm trying. Uh, but I'm also witnessing the incredible rise of women's cricket. Hmm. So it's coming full circle. In fact, we have the big uh, World Cup for women uh, in February, March of next year in Australia. And it's going to be a fantastic event. So it's a lot of fun to be in cricket. Uh, why is cricket a great um, game for life? You know, most team sports are great games to teach you about life, how to work in a team, how to um, give and take, you know, when to take a run, when not to take a run, the give and take, um, planning strategy for how you're gonna kill the opponent, all of that, you know, they're wonderful games of life. And for me, uh, New York Yankees baseball and cricket are my two um, passions. So I'm involved with them. So in a minute, we're going to open it to questions. So please get your questions ready. There'll be microphones in the two uh, channels here. I just want to come back to the question of women's cricket because it's the fastest growing sport mm. in many countries. And together with Mark Nicholas, who's a well-known television commentator, he and I started a charity to promote cricket in state schools where it had been disappearing. And one of the unexpected side products of that was that now, now over four million children have been through the project. Mm. Half of those are girls. That was not expected when we started. Mm. And the women's team in it, the English women's team, coach in this program mm -hmm. when they're not actually playing for England. So anyone who hasn't yet got a sport, forget <coughs> golf. If that's not the way to business success, cricket is. <laughs> actually, so, we're going to open up USA Cricket. Ah, tremendous. Oh, yes. Right. We're investing heavily in USA Cricket. And there are many, 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 many players in the United States who yeah. want to play cricket. And the hope is that we could get cricket into the 2028 Olympics in LA. That's the Excellent. Hope. Well, that's a real ambition. Yeah. Wonderful. Now, uh, questions from the audience. So there's one here. I'm sure there'll be many. There's one at the front here, and then there's one just over there. And I'm sure there are others. Thank you so much for coming. Pleasure. Uh, so it, it, um, three companies that are going through sort of uh, issues and stumbling blocks right now are WeWork, you know, Jewel Labs and Boeing. If you could just, if you were CEOs of, of, of each of these companies, what advice, or if you were consulting each of these companies, what advice would you give them and how would you use your management style to kind of turn them around or get them over the stumbling block? <laughs> <laughs> you know, That's I'll be honest with you. And, uh, whatever I say is gonna sound arrogant, so please don't uh, take out the arrogance interpretation. Uh, if I was CEO of any of these three, we wouldn't be in the mess we are in. <laughs> okay, because it's harder to clean up messes than it is not to get into the mess in the first place, all right? Um, it's better to delay a program than to launch something hurriedly and face the consequences later on. I can't tell you how many projects in PepsiCo, they didn't, it didn't hurdle on product taste, we just pull it at the last minute. Just say it's not worth launching. Even though the cost of failure of a PepsiCo product was much smaller, we just pull it. Um, never ever try to launch a company where you don't have a clear pathway to profitability. 
and you know, moats around the relevant parts of the business. If you don't have it, don't launch it. And um, if you're a company which is viewed as sort of the sin company, don't try to compensate for one sin with another sin. Okay? So recovery from these problems is much harder. And the best way to do it is typically management gets changed, if it is necessary. Uh, and then the new person has to clean house to make sure that it doesn't ever happen again. So. One, there was one over there just behind you. Yep, there we are. I'll, I'll need some. Can you say who you are? When you yes, I, I'm Shan Gu. I'm a, a professor here in ah, finance. Very nice to meet you. Uh, nice to meet you. Thank you for coming. Uh, I'm very curious why you decided to leave, perhaps, uh, leave your position as CEO. And I wonder how much that decision was anticipated and whether your employees and other stakeholders like lenders behave differently towards um, anticipate your potential anticipated departure? 12 years is a long time to be CEO. <laughs> the average tenure is about six in my industry. Eight would be very high. So 12 years is a long time. So everybody knew that I was, you know, I was there longer than most. Um, the wonderful thing about PepsiCo is that we have a very, very orderly succession process. So, uh, you know, we build the pipeline. Uh, we get the candidates lined up with big jobs so the street knows who's being groomed for big jobs. And then a year or so before the decision, we elevate a couple of people to even bigger jobs. So everybody knows the change is coming. Um, and if anybody was surprised by my stepping down, I never heard about it because they viewed PepsiCo as a textbook transition um, example, which it has been in the history of our company. We've always had insiders. And they've always been through a logical and planned methodical transition process. So from my point of view, uh, I was tired. After 12 years, um, I really wanted to do something else. And so our board is a very good board. We had wonderful conversations, and we had a wonderful transition. So everything worked out fine. Well, you're certainly not tired now. Now there's a question <laughs> Hi, over there. Hi, David Knapp um, okay, with American then, Express. Then after that, down here on the so and uh, I want to ask you, you mentioned that you were excited, um, surprised that you got into Yale. And um, there's a lot of people who have an imposter syndrome. And I'm wondering when in your career you thought, wow, like, I really am incredibly successful. And the rest of my you know, tenure is going to be great. Like, how far into your career were you when you sat back and had that reflective moment? You know, until my last day at CEO, I didn't, still didn't feel that way. I'll tell you why. Because as an immigrant, you have an immigrant's fear. And the fear you have is, oh, you might fail, and you'll shame your family. This is maybe an Indian cultural thing, OK? And so at every point in time, I was like, I hope I'm doing OK. I hope I'm earning my job. I hope I'm earning the right to be CEO. I hope I'm doing the right thing. So I always had that fear in the back of my head. There was never a time I felt I've landed, and I'm successful, I'm powerful. Those you know, uh, badges meant nothing to me. I was always worried about what, how I was doing the job and whether I was worthy of doing the job. Um, now I can sit back and say, yeah, maybe it was uh, successful. You know, I met somebody from PepsiCo last week who came to visit with me, and they were saying, Indra, do you know we did A, B, C, D, and they rattled off everything we'd done. I said, yeah, I guess we did all of that stuff. But while we were doing it, it just felt like we have to get it done, not that we were ticking off milestones, and success was being measured that way. So maybe just an immigrant's fear, different mindset. Yeah. Hi, I'm Snehi Kapoor. I'm one of the executive MBA students here. Um, my question is regarding, you mentioned megatrends. So bigger companies monitor megatrends, and so do smaller ones like mine. Um, what is your uh, one takeaway in terms of, or, or advice for a young company or for a small company when bigger companies like Amazon are entering every single space to survive or to do better, or except for being acquired by a bigger company? What space are you in? Uh, healthcare, in particular. Healthcare, yeah. Look, that's a area that's ripe for innovation and uh, invention. So um, you know, you've got to think through how the space is going to change, or what trends are going to impact your space over the next few years, and what space you want to occupy there as a niche company. I mean, I'm looking at 
digital healthcare startups all the time. I'm looking at insurance companies like Oscar starting up. I'm looking at what uh, Atul Gawande is doing with the three big companies with uh, Haven. So I think the opportunities for big companies, small companies, little niche companies abounds in this digital, in this healthcare space. Depends which area you want to go into and why. What do you have that makes you worthy of being in that space? That's a question you have to answer yourself. And uh, sometimes, you know what? Um, a big company buying you out might put you out of your misery because you can't scale. Sometimes you just can't scale up. But I hope you're successful with your company. And I uh, wish you all the luck. Mm. There's a question over here on the right and then the second row here afterwards. Hi. Again, Hi thank you for coming. Um, I'm an undergraduate student here at NYU. I'm a senior. And I just have a question about the megatrends that you mentioned. Mm. So in Bolivia and in my experience with South America, it seems like the health trend isn't as prevalent as here in America. People, like, at least in my experience, still seem to enjoy um, sugary drinks and not really healthy snacks, you would say. So I was just thinking, like, in your experience, do you think this change will it's expand like the way it has in, in the US to regions like South America? Uh, it has. I mean, let me take Mexico as an example. Let me take Chile. Let me take Colombia. Let me take all those countries. Um, I remember uh, Mexico talking to the Mexican team, and the Mexican team said, we in Mexico love our sugary drinks, and we love our salty snacks. You know, we own Sabritas and Gamesa in Mexico. We own, we own those markets. Um, Yet, if I looked at the underlying trends in Mexico, I felt that there would be an increased focus on health and wellness. Just look at all the statistics. Now, I want to be very clear. Our products are only 2% of the consumption calories, 2%. Yet, I thought every company in the ecosystem should worry about these issues. Because if every 2% company says, not my issue, collectively, we won't make change. I just felt all of us collectively had to lean in. Um, any time I talked to my team in Mexico, they wouldn't admit there was any issue. But as an outsider, every time I went in, I could see the issues. I could see the landfill, the uh, junk lying on the uh, sides of the road. Um, I see the obesity statistics creeping up because the food there itself is high in fat. What happens six months later? The Mexican government imposes a huge soda tax. Okay, so I think what one has to do is. Uh, Look at all the numbers and statistics objectively. And draw for yourself conclusions, almost as if to say, if I were president of the country, what would I do? And if you think that way, uh, you can draw a line and say, in five years, there could be some action. So let me change the portfolio now. Okay? But in changing the portfolio, I'm not telling you that by reducing the sugar, you make a lousy product. It's still a great tasting product, but with lower sugar. Okay. Great tasting product with zero sugar. So the challenge is how do you give you the same great taste without the negatives? And that's what performance and purpose was all about. Okay. Question here on the second row. Hi, thanks Hi. for being here. My name is Amy Ho. I'm a second year full-time MBA student here. Um, I work for a family office that does early stage investments in better for you consumer products. Um, and I know Pepsi did some awesome uh, acquisitions like Bear Snacks and SodaStream. So my question for you is, do you have advice for early stage investors that are trying to shape the space the right way? Um, or you know, what, how can we do the right thing? Look, uh, are you in the food space? I am. OK. The first thing, and you know, again, I'm going to give a generalized observation. It may not be in your company's case. All the small companies we bought, or many of them we bought, what we discovered, and we, all, we usually bought them when they were between 30 and $100 million in revenue. Because there are stall points in these small companies. The first stall point comes at about 30 million. The next stall point is at 100 million, then at 200 million. Struggle to scale. <coughs> what we discovered was many small companies, what was on the label and what was in the product were not consistent. Okay? So remember, if you really want to succeed and get to the next plateau and the next plateau, you have to make sure your product authenticity is complete. Um, uh, we bought a drink called Sobi. How many of you know Sobi, the drink? You've heard of it? <coughs> you guys are a really well-educated uh, group. Um, <coughs> you better tell me what it is. We bought Sobi <laughs> as a beverage some year, you know, maybe about uh, 15 years ago. And 
when we bought Sobe, we didn't do the due diligence on the labels and the product because it was doing so well. It was $100 million in sales. Once we bought the product, we put the R&D guys to work on it. And they found that the label and the product didn't really sync up. Or as a small company, you could say things about the product that as a large company, we can't say. For example, Sobe had a line which was called Sobe liquid liposuction. Liquid liposuction. What was it? It was a lower calorie Sobe product. Now, if PepsiCo called a product liquid liposuction, what do you think a lawyer is going to do? A lawyer from NYU is going to do. <laughs> you know, there would be a lawsuit against us saying, we didn't see anything liquid or liposuction about this product. So what happens is, as a small company, if you start doing the right things now, it might add to your costs, but it'll create a more robust company. And at some point, you will want to flip it, unless you have infinite resources, because uh, scaling up in uh, consumer products is very, very expensive. And so you have to partner with a big company. You'll get a better price if you create the right product where all the elements of the business model align themselves to the truth of the product. Okay. Question on the fifth row here. Thank you for your time today. This is amazing. I'm such a fan girl, so I'm just going to be shameless about it. Um, my name is Uttara, and my question for you was around um, the way unicorn companies are growing today versus how, you, when you look at companies from the prior generations and how they've grown strategically, and you're seeing how overnight growth is, growth is happening with companies today. What's your perspective, and where do you see some of these companies go, growing? It's a generalization because there are good unicorns and then there are unicorns still finding their way. Uh, recently, uh, a bunch of us retired CEOs are doing a lot of work with unicorns. People who want to go public next year or the year after have reached you know, a line of sight to over $100 million in sales. Some of them have got multiple hundreds of millions of dollars in sales. Again, what they don't realize is when you grow so fast, if you don't build the foundation of the company when you are small, you're never going to build it when you get big. Right when you're, before you go public, be very clear where your advantage lies. What are you going to invest in? What are you going to outsource? Where are you going to borrow services? Be very clear what your business ecosystem is going to look like. And have a clean line of sight to saying, I may be investing for the next five years, but after that, here is a clean line of sight on, in terms of how I'm going to make money. Very few companies have that. And then they offset their inability to talk about how they're going to make money through financing mechanisms. If I did this lease model with this buyback model, with this repurchase model, with this low debt model, I'll be OK. Doesn't work. All those are games. You know, like the finder finder game they have in the Caribbean is one of those. I don't think that's what we should be looking at. What is a clean business model? that will deliver profits in whatever time frame. Articulate the case. Articulate how you're going to build moats around part of your business. These unicorns can succeed. I think uh, generally, uh, a general statement I'd make is a lot of the unicorns started by founders need some adult supervision. <laughs> That's what they need. OK? Excellent. There's a question near the back. Hi, Indra. This is Ankur Kamkalia. Um, I'm also a fangirl, and oh. I've been watching your career for many years. And you've influenced many of my decisions, including coming to Stern for my MBA. Um, what a, my question is, I have two questions. One is, do you see companies like Amazon and Google sort of turning to uh, heavily regulated sectors like financial services, um, whether it's payments or asset management? Uh, and my second question is, I've heard a lot of stories about your success. Do you have any stories of uh, failure to share with us as well? Mm. Thanks. Um, you know, I don't know where Amazon and Google are going to go and whether they're going to become regulated companies. Um, I think regulation is needed if you behave badly. Okay? Um, and more and more regulation happens if you behave, you know, if your bad behavior continues, which it did for many financial institutions, witness the 2007 crisis. And you should talk to Lord Mervyn King about this. He knows all about it. <laughs> um, if a company behaves responsibly, if an industry sector behaves responsibly, it anticipates regulation and changes its behavior to avoid punitive re regulation. There might be oversight, but they, 
uh, transform the model to prevent punitive regulation. I hope some of the big tech companies do that themselves, as opposed to being regulated by people who don't even understand the industry. Okay, so that's my hope. Um, to your second question on failures, you know, uh, all of us become better because of failures. If you only had successes, you know, what do we have to learn from? Um, I can't tell you how many failures one has had, business-wise, personally, you know, over my career, over my 40-year career. Um, sometimes I look back and say, did I just have bad luck or what happened? I look at each of, them, each of those failures as a teaching or a learning experience because um, I, I went back and I thought about what did I do wrong that I failed? Or what was wrong with my behavior that ticked off somebody else? And when you look at each of these as teachable moments, you become better and more humble after failure. So it's how you approach the failure rather than the failure itself that makes you a better leader. Another question just in front. And then we have this lady here who's had her hand up oh, for a long I'm time, sorry. the white hair. Hi, uh, my name's Kevin Parks. Uh, yes, Kevin. I founded my own company about three years ago, and I really enjoyed the part of the conversation where uh, Lord King started to talk about uh, people he knew or had worked with who are so successful because of the passion they have. And I find that in my own kind of day job, I, I focus more on and find myself you know, trying to hit goals kind of objectively and working in the asset management space. It seems like you know, one of the things... Um, you know, to, to the point that you were talking about, you know, beating an index, doing things that are objectively measured as successes. I'm wondering what the, some of the more intangible parts of your job or your character that you think has set you apart or some of the more intangible elements of, you know, just our, collectively as people we can kind of work on to help try and measure success a little better. Interesting. So let me, uh, clearly in our jobs, there have to be some objective measures, you know, like performance with purpose goals. You know, those were all public, um, and those were made explicit, output metrics, um, and uh, uh, sort of in-process metrics. What are we investing? Uh, what's the return on the investments? All of those were tangible metrics, and those are all good success metrics, because without them, there's no point talking about other leadership qualities. Um, let me tell you what I did in my time at PepsiCo. Um, first, I absolutely, totally loved everybody I worked with. I loved my employees. And let me tell you how I showed my love to them. I just didn't tell them I loved them. I gave them tough love. I coached them and I mentored them constantly, constantly. Um, I would, um, I'll give you one crazy example, which I look back today and say, I must have been daft to have done that. Um, the team in Russia um, was preparing to make a major presentation for an acquisition. I flew to Russia on a Friday. I worked with them all weekend to prepare for this presentation. And I flew back on Sunday from Russia. And I was, as I was leaving, I said to the Russia team, do you realize what I just did? I'm the CFO of the company. I flew down to Russia to help you write this presentation, which you're going to present to the CFO on Wednesday. Yeah. Does it make any sense? Would any other CFO do it? Probably not. But the reason I did it is because when that team came to present to the CFO, not to Indra Nui, when they came to present to the CFO, I wanted them to look good. Because that's the way they learn how to work a presentation and do it better. On the other hand, had they presented to me and I said, this is a lousy acquisition, you guys have no case, get out, would have demoralized them. On the other hand, did it take a weekend off my life? Yeah. But it made this team such a loyal team to me as I became CEO. So there's a great line which says the distance between a number one and number two is a constant. If you want to lift your organization, you've got to lift yourself. Because the distance between the number one and two is constant. So I constantly lifted myself, and I forced the organization to rise up with me. And when they struggled, I put a hand out and lifted them up. So it was an enormous time commitment. But there's one thing I think most people in PepsiCo miss is that constant pushing I gave people to do better, to do better, to do better. I used to have three colored pens. I had a blue, purple, green, and red. Four felt pens, you know? And whichever pen was there, I would write on it. Once I sent the decks out, I would write on every page. People would say, this is in purple ink. What does she mean by purple ink versus blue ink on this page? So I had to issue a memo which says the ink colors don't mean anything. Don't spend a minute thinking about that. 
focus on the questions on every page. I read everything my people sent me. I gave them comments. I gave them ideas how to improve what they did. Sometimes I would tell them things like, great deck, but a trained monkey could have done it. Could you do better? You know, but they knew I, I said it from a place of love, not a place of anger or hatred. So you have to decide as a leader how you want to motivate and coach your people. Because your success is a function of how well your organization improves over time. And One last question. Yindra, you identify the question. I could right just, there. Go okay. ahead. Right. Thank you. My name is Janet Valenza. I'm an NYU alum, and I own a business. Uh -huh. And I want to thank you for coming, Indra. You're an incredible inspiration to me. Thank you. And you just mentioned about lifting yourself up. So you rose so high. Who, I wonder, was your inspiration? And how did you inspire yourself to continue to grow? Sometimes continuing to grow is not an option, it's a necessity. Uh, because uh, if you wanted to convince the organization to make major investments in uh, you know, AI for something, you can't just say, I'm going to put AI into this area. Nobody knows what it is. So as a CEO, I had to learn everything about the space and uh, communicate it to people sort of in a chicky-ducky way so that they can understand and make the changes. So in the past, it used to be brief the top and train the bottom. Today, it's train the top and train the bottom. So I had to train myself to become well-versed in all these new technologies. In terms of inspiration, um, there isn't one person that inspired me. For different things, different people inspired me. For recovering from failures, um, you know, I'd look at um, you know, people in PepsiCo who had a sick child, an aging parent, uh, you know, a spouse who was going through a mental illness, and they would still come to work, smile, and perform. And I sit there going, how do they do it? I know all the problems they have. How do they do it? And any time I had a problem, I'd say, if so-and-so could do it with so many problems in their life, surely I can do it. So at every point in time, my frame changed. Uh, if I had to push myself to learn something brand new, I'd say, look, if so-and-so could have gone back to school at age 50 to learn a new skill, I can do it to run this company. So I was constantly looking for the right role model to get inspired by, as opposed to picking one person and saying, you are it. I'm going to be you, because you know, it's never going to work. It's too complex a subject. But thank you for asking that question. Appreciate it. Ladies and gentlemen, I think you'll all agree with me that we've been privileged tonight to, to see and learn at first hand exactly what it takes to be a successful chief executive. And that's the cue for our own CEO, the <laughs> Dean who will close the session tonight. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so thank much. You. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. You're going to have to repeat that all over again after I speak. <laughs> so uh, on a serious note, though, thank you, Mervyn. Thank you, Indra, for a truly wonderful, wonderful evening. Not just the sage advice, but the warm humor with which it was imparted. <laughs> I think that will be remembered as much. Um, for me, this evening was special for many reasons, not just seeing one of Madras's most spectacular success stories here at Stern, but most of all, as a fellow cricket tragic, seeing this mention of cricket on stage at Stern in NYU, I never thought I would see this day. So thank you very much. Uh, a very small token of our appreciation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for your questions and please do join us uh, at the reception uh, just outside.